Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel here at the noon block on a given Thursday. We're talking about history. History is here to help. I'd like to add, you know, in the context of what's going on in Congress this week, history can only help if you want it to help. If you want to reject it and ignore it, mm, it can't help very much. But that's not us. Uh, here we have uh, Peter Hoffenberg, uh, history um, in UH, and uh, Jane Rosenfeld, UCLA, a career at UCLA. And uh, we're going to talk about some of her writings recently and her thinking. And the, the title of our show is uh, Religion and Terrorism, a Strange Connection. You know, it, it seems less strange all the time, Jane. Welcome to the show, Peter. Gene. Thank you very much. Good Thank to see you. Thank you for having us. So, Peter, why don't you, you know, give a better introduction of Gene so we really know who she really is. Who she really is. All right. Well, she's the beloved grandmother. No, okay. We won't do the, we won't do the Yiddish line. No, I think um, for the audience and for ourselves, uh, Jean is a, a scholar of many things, but I asked her to join us today because of particularly her interest in thinking about uh, issues such as nationalism, terrorism, and fascism, which have been tossed around all the time. Uh, she brings to bear a, a very detailed scholarly approach to those as religions. I hope I'm not misrepresenting your work, Jean, but as a historian of religion, and a historian of political ideologies, uh, a protege of David Rappaport, one of the most important scholars on terrorism, um, I would very much like to hear Jean's understanding of religion in and of itself. So how we use that term and how that term can be applicable to help us understand this immense mishigas, which is just overwhelming so much of the world. Uh, she's published a book, published articles, she's a very active member of our, our Jewish community. So I hope that does you justice, Jean. I mean, can't really do you justice, but at least gives folks a sense that's well, we are honest. very interested in what you have to say about the, the topic of religion and terrorism, and that's the style of our show, but also on uh, the article you wrote, which I saw called Fasci Fascism as Action Through Time, or How It Can Happen Here, concluding it can, yes, it can happen here, which you wrote in 2017, three years ago. That's a very, very interesting article in the context of what's going on. So I guess uh, when, when I think of religion and and terrorism, I think uh, that religion is uh, somehow incorporated internally and externally in, in Trumpism. Um, is, is that a part of your thinking on this? Well, I work with a group of wonderful interdisciplinary scholars and have for many years who study these unusual, new, and sometimes very short-lived religions. That fascism is not short-lived. And um, our definition of religion is quite different from what you hear in the public square. Our definition of religion is whatever people consider their ultimate concern. That's from theologian Paul Tillich. And what it means is what people are determined to live by and die for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how would you differentiate that, say, from a, an ideology or philosophy? Because those terms could also be applied to fascism. Oftentimes, what we consider religious is spoken of as ideology. If, if you're kind of aware of listening to news programs, how much the news media avoids the word religion, Mm -hmm. And so do the civil authorities, because there are laws regarding religion that protect people who act out of religious motivation, mm -hmm. and they would prefer not to have those um, laws apply in many cases when there are court uh, cases involved. So um, we, we see uh, America as largely identified as a Christian country, and Christianity is a faith. It, it mm -hmm. deals with belief. It deals with prayer. It, believe, it deals with God. But those, that's a very limited view of religion. So we like to expand it into the realm of ideology. And there isn't a fine line between the two. And there's not a fine line between political ideology and religion either. Because just to give you one example, Mussolini is regarded as the 
person who introduced fascism to the world. That's not really true. It was existed before, but nobody had really identified it as such. 10 years after he gained power, he wrote a manifesto with his minister of education, Giovanni Gentile. And he said, you know, when I started out, I really didn't have a vision or an ideology. He said, but this is what fascism is. And he defined it as a religion, as spiritual primarily, as moral and spiritual. And it was a dogma that he produced. So he sees it in religious terms and he was the progenitor, so to speak. Right. How close is that to Nazism? It's quite close. Uh, Nazism is a German form of fascism. Each, each society has its own form of fascism. We have ours too. It emerged after the Civil War, and that was in the Ku Klux Klan. And then it reemerged in the National Ku Klux Klan around 1920. And it, it was uh, disseminated outside of the South throughout the entire country. And these militia groups and other groups we see today that we regard as domestic terrorists now, um, there are many of them that owe a great deal to that Ku Klux Klan, because even after it fell apart, it continued in the different states. So the ideology or religion of the Ku Klux Klan has persisted and it has now emerged again. Well, it sounds like um, the current ideology um, of, of the, the insurrectionists, if you will, um, is that Trump is a, a religious um, icon. Um, they take their instructions from him. They believe he's right no matter what he says. Um, and they will follow him anywhere. Um, is, that, is that a religion? Can you classify that as an ideology or a religion? Can you classify it as that not, as fascism? Not in itself, no, Jay. Um, but I do classify it as charismatic leadership. And that's very I to, important. I used to like the word charismatic. Yeah. You know, charis means grace in the Bible. It's a lovely word. But charismatic leadership, the idea was developed by Max Weber. And uh, it's been very, very productive as a theory. And what it does is that at the center of fascism is the figure of the leader. That's, that's pretty definitive of fascism, to have a charismatic leader. He's a showman. He's an actor. He's a performer. And he demands complete loyalty. He has to be a bit of a magician. He has to convince his followers that he can work magic, that he all his promises will be fulfilled. And specifically, when you look at Trump, that he's always a winner. He can never be a loser. And the people, the idea of, of the people is um, appropriated by the leader. He is the representative. He is the embodiment. He's not the representative. Our traditional leaders are representatives of us. But a charismatic fascist leader is the embodiment of the people. So what he does, and, and all power accrues to him, he does for the people. Therefore, loyalty to him is disloyalty to him is sedition. And he is, like in a some, sense, a kind of a deity, yes. Yes, a kind of deity. I mean, I think it's existed long before we ever thought about fascism. I mean, this is a flaw in the, in the humanity, isn't it? Well... Definitely, when you see a charismatic leader who is as negative as Trump or Hitler or Mussolini or Putin, um, you want to think of it as a flaw in humanity. But think of Buddha. Think of Jesus. Think of Muhammad. We owe a lot to charismatic leadership. What it does, what it means, it's in contradistinction to the usual traditional and bureaucratic leaderships that we are used to. The pathway to the presidency is a bureaucratic pathway. And typically fascist leaders will take that legal bureaucratic pathway as Hitler did for six years and as Mussolini did. And then they will achieve it with basically not a majority, but for other reasons, they will achieve it legally. And then they will suddenly reveal as this type of leadership, which is opposed or in contradistinction to the values and the institutions of the country they now are in charge of. 
So you're saying that this pathway, and I recall, uh, uh, I think it was Paxton that you wrote about in that article, uh, had half a dozen steps along the way from where you go through various uh, changes in the, in the community, and uh, then you get to be um, a, a despot at the end, uh, and it gets to be fascism. But it, it sounds like this is, this is, you could identify a number of societies in history that have followed the same, the same path, pathway. This is, this is nothing new. This, 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 these rules have existed for a long time. Am I right? Um, partly. Um, it, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, human beings engage in patterned group behavior. And it's replicated throughout history, but it's never identical. You have to be able to recognize it. People employ different symbols and symbolic expressions and ideas of sacrality and deity, but the pattern is the same. And what Paxton has done, Robert Paxton, who's a very recognized scholar of fascism, is he has devised five stages. They're extremely general. And I tried to make them much more specific to America today, which is what you have to do. In order to identify a phenomenon, you have to know the basic fundamental pattern which Paxton has identified. And then in order to elaborate it and describe it and learn about it, you have to see how those very general, that very general framework works out in specifics in your own society and bring that to bear. And I think in the latter part of the article, I have several points that I brought out and I aligned them with Paxton's general stages. I told you it reminds me of Ann Applebaum's uh, article um, uh, comparing um, you know, what we have today with what was going on in Eastern Europe uh, after the Second World War. Um, and the big question there, at least a part of that article, was uh, how does a normal person deal with this when one observes that we are on that path? Uh, what do we do? Because sometimes we would be able to see that it's not a good path. And what will we do to be able to deal with it? I see Peter shaking his head. He's got some ideas. I know he does. No, I'm listening. I'm listening. So, uh, Gene, did you finish what you wanted to say or? I oh, to get sure, go ahead. This, really, this is Gene's show. Your viewers are blowing your opinion. Yeah. So uh, I guess um, I would only add, I, mean, I am in agreement with Gene, um, most things. Um, a couple things I would add is when we talk about fascism, I would very much differentiate between uh, fascism with a little F as a religious belief and fascism with a capital F as a state. Because I think one of the phenomenons of successful fascism, and in this case, Trump is only partially successful, is while saying you are anti-modern, in fact, to infiltrate and use the state. Uh, and I think you've seen that in this case uh, with McConnell, probably even as much if not more than with, uh, with uh, Trump. So I would agree with the sense of a religion, but I would think that uh, you know a capital F is, is a church. It has its institutions, its structures, its leadership. Um, I also think that the, the Applebaum uh, position uh, reveals one of the flaws that, that we really all have, which is uh, even if we find what's going on despicable, we have to really try to understand how and why these people feel sets a sense of betrayal uh, I mean, one of the cru critical and really crucial political missteps was Mrs. Clinton calling these people deplorable. That only accentuates their sense of resentment. And I think Applebaum misses the boat. Um, Applebaum doesn't understand that the people she surrounds herself with and has surrounded herself with have been the victors of neoliberalism after 1945. And a lot of these folks are victims of neoliberalism. And so I'm, uh, I'm wary of uh, suggesting like Applebaum that somehow uh, we only need to blame Republican senators who aren't doing anything about it. Um, I think we're perhaps, that's the tip of the iceberg. We're kind of missing the essential iceberg. And that's why I'm, I'm a little wary about 
throwing around the term fascism. I mean, I think I, I see a lot of populism here. Uh, I agree entirely with Gene's point about charismatic leadership. Uh, charismatic leadership can be Martin Luther King Jr. So it's a matter of, and populism can be Martin Luther King Jr. So I, to me, the, these divisions have been in this country ever since Hamilton and Jefferson. They are, they are part of our DNA. But Gene, let me go back to the question of what is, what is a right thinking person? Not, not necessarily a, a history professor or a philosopher or a scholar. A right thinking person do uh, when that person finds that there is a fascism, however you define it, as a negative community experience is growing uh, in his or her midst. What does that person do? Well, I consider myself a pretty ordinary person. And the first thing I did when I suspected it is I went to someone who knows more than I did, <laughs> my mentor. And I said, do you know anything about fascism that I can study? And then I began to study and then I began to link it to what I was already doing, which was um, following, I guess you would call them insurrectionist underground groups in the 1990s that brought us Oklahoma City. And um, I, I think that as I went along and I saw more of this, I linked it up to the nativist idea of nativist and apocalyptic and millennial movements that I had sort of specialized in. I began to see the relationships. And then I thought, when I saw Trump coming up, <laughs> rising up, I thought, wow, this looks like Triumph of the Will, that movie that Lenny Riefenstahl made about Hitler's um, party rally uh, and before he came to power. And you see Trump coming down the golden staircase. He's coming down from heaven. You see him coming out of his airplane. And you see in Triumph of the Will, you see the opening scenes of Hitler descending from the clouds in his airplane. And that was back in the 1930s when airplanes weren't that usual. But they deliberately, they're showmen, they're performers. They deliberately do this to appeal to the emotion. It's an appeal to the emotions. And to, to rally support that is um, more committed than ordinary support. So what does the ordinary person do? First, go to someone who you think can explain it to you. Timothy Snyder wrote his book uh, on tyranny in order to inform us, basically. And um, then see what you can understand about it and continue to try to understand it. But most importantly, to teach it. I actually did develop a course in which I introduced it. And I had college students come to me afterwards and say, gee, nobody's ever told us about this before. Because after World War II, people wanted to forget. It was so traumatic. They wanted to forget. We should never forget. Some people are forgetting what happened on January 6th, and that was three weeks ago. Yes. Um, but but I, you know, I'm uh, interested in um, what you think happened on January 6th in terms of the confluence of all of these threads you know, we've been talking about here. What was really going on as opposed to, say, a year or two or three earlier? What happened in this country as, as was revealed conceptually on January 6th? It was revealed, it came on the radar, big time. It's been brewing since the 1970s. And that would take a very long time to explain. Nevertheless, what happened on January 6th is you saw a lot of people doing what's called an enactment. You know about the enactors of history. We have enactors in small towns throughout the United States. First, you notice these people were in costume. Secondly, they were very, very manifest with their symbols and their flags and their t-shirts. And they were enacting mythology. Their mythology, which we refer to as conspiracy theories, is the key to understanding their mindset and understanding them 
not as deplorables or as domestic terrorists or as brainwashed cultists, but rather truly understanding them as human beings that we can relate to because we have our mythologies too. We all have our mythologies, but they were in opposition. Again, they're following a leader who's in opposition to our institutions, in opposition to our traditions, and specifically has focused on dividing us. And radical dualism, division into good and evil is essential, it's apocalyptic, to motivating people to come and quote, save the country. They want to save America. So in their minds, they were saving America. What kind of America? The kind of America that David Lane in the 1990s proposed in his 14 words, which are now adopted by the alt-right. And that is, we must secure the existence for our people, the existence of, of, of our people and a future for white children. So who are our people in the predicate? You have white children, the white people and their history. That's the only America they know. They're generally white Christians. White yeah. Christians. Yeah. yeah. It right. reminds we, me of this uh, that the religious advertisement stuff. played on the Super Bowl by Bruce Springsteen or Jeep, the automobile manufacturer. Right. The, the okay. difficulty, though, I think, <laughs> look, the difficulty in a modern democracy is everything that Gene has absolutely pinpointed about the people we don't like. We could make the same analysis of the left or progressives as a religion as well. So what, to me, what we have is, is a, a moral problem because the sense of uh, who, who is one of the most famous American terrorists, John Brown. Yeah. Now, the way that she described John Brown, you could describe the abolitionist movement, including Brown as a Trumpist figure uh, he was willing to sacrifice himself, right? I mean, the irony, the irony of people like Trump is they're not really willing in the end to sacrifice themselves. And that's where the Jesus metaphor falls through. But what interests me is ab absolutely what you described, a religion, a sense of race, a sense of mythology, a sense of enactment, which is often Calvary in one way or another, right? I'm willing to sacrifice myself, all the Christianity. But what do we do if those characteristics are actually on our side as well. After all, people died in, fairy, in, uh, uh, in John Brown's uh, seizure of Harper's Ferry. Kansas was bloody before, or Brown and his, his sons murdered uh, folks in Kansas who they disagreed with. So uh, what do we do? I mean, the, the notion of commercializing politics, uh, T-shirts, um, names on mugs, uh, propaganda goes at least back to the abolitionist movement. You could say the abolitionist movement was the first Western movement to do what you described, including making uh, freed slaves charismatic leaders. So what, what do we do when the moral divide is so great? The, the structures are very similar. I mean, we have our all, Joy, Jay and I talked, I, I agree with you in the 1970s. And one of the reasons I believe in the 1970s is we're still fighting the Vietnam War. And the folks who seized the Capitol were people who thought generally we should have won that war or we were sold out. So I, I don't know, how, how do we have a moral revolution in which what you described is the most powerful mythology and the most powerful enactment. Well, let, let me throw another, uh, another idea in here. You know, um, you talk about the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, Trump had a, um, a bone spur. He and doesn't what? know anything about the, the no. Vietnam War. He went to the University of uh, Pennsylvania. I think he got in because his father's father had a twist there. Um, I don't think he did well. He's very reluctant to release his grade point average or his, his grades. Um, I, I don't think he's well-educated. We, we know he doesn't read much, doesn't like to take notes. And yet, at this 
project, he seems to be pretty good at this project being the showman and the like and, and you know, consolidating power and affecting the minds and hearts of, of hundreds of millions of, well, many tens of millions of people, he's pretty good. Now, we, we're talking about some pretty um, conceptual um, things, historical things, philosophical things. Do you think that Trump follows this? What enables him to do the remarkable things that he has done? He's done remarkable things. What has enabled him to bring half the country um, under his banner and make them go, you know, ran ransack the Capitol? That's quite... That's quite an achievement if you look at it uh, from their point of view. Um, what is he smart? Um, what is it? What kind of talent does he have that he could do this? Is there a parallel between him and Mussolini and Hitler and Putin? Uh, what what makes Trump so successful? You want to go first, Gene, and then I'll go. Um, well, that's a very good question. And uh, I guess we would say that if you have a high IQ, you are academically able to negotiate a university education, but that is about a sliver of human intelligence. And, so by without it. and yeah. there are very gifted people who fall outside of that sliver, including these unusual charismatic personalities. And you see, for example, David Koresh, was associated by the FBI with uh, a retarded person. He was dyslexic. He wasn't educated. He was from the lower class. But he certainly ex exercised charismatic leadership. So there are always individuals born and raised under certain circumstances. And if you want to know more about Trump, read Mary Trump's book, um, that develop this personality. And we see them in history. Hitler was not well-educated. And Mussolini wasn't particularly well-educated. So let's set that aside. Set that aside. That's kind of an Ivy League perspective. We don't need that. <laughs> OK. Well, I'm so not, let me ask you. Me, you wanted to weigh in on that? Yeah, I would definitely like to, to weigh in on that. And again, like with Jean, uh, complimentary. Uh, to hers, you you asked um, how was he able to succeed? Basically, okay. So I think we have to, uh, as a Ivy League academic, I apologize. Uh, we got to get back to what you mean by success. Let's let's remember that he lost two consecutive popular votes. All right. Let's please let's always remember that Mrs. Clinton and Biden both overwhelmingly, as far as those ballots that were counted. And I would wager my Mickey Mantle mint baseball card that there were many for Biden and Mrs. Clinton that were not counted rather than vice versa. The corruption mostly seems to be on the other side, not, not the Democratic side. So what is success? Well, success is not his intelligence, but his political manager's intelligence to know which states he can get the electoral college based primarily upon grievance. This is, a, I believe, very much in Hofstetter's view, the kind of grievance that drives American politics. Now, grievance can also drive progressivism, right? I find slavery abhorrent. Okay, but in this case, it's a grievance which is a minority grievance. I mean, what we have, unfortunately, is, is a democratic society in which minority is ruling. Most Americans agree with abortion of some sort. Every, uh, Americans overwhelmingly agree with gun control, 70%. So success is not his brilliance, but really his political manager's brilliance to see how the political system can be manipulated. You don't need an Ivy League education. What you do need, though, are people who understand politics. What's interesting like, is that- Like the people at Fox News understood politics until until January 6th. Now, the second point I'd like to make, and I know I'm, I'm beating the dead horse, but I don't really think it's a dead horse, is the question of race. Trump has been a race baiter. I don't know if you guys remember the five innocent young men who were charged with the Central Park murder. Of course, they were acquitted, but
but you might not have seen the press conferences where he promised to pay money to people who found the suspects and immediately said the suspects should be executed. I will wager my Babe Ruth mint card that if it had been reversed, if a black woman had been attacked and there were five white guys, you would not find Trump. So Trump's brilliance, right, is seeing that Americans, particularly white Americans, just cannot get over this sense that they are being replaced. All of the information that, that Gene suggests about the 1970s, right? That's part of what's fueling it, right? The great replacement theory, which is now over 100 years old. Well, you know, but, one element- Trump is, Trump is a race baiter. He's a race baiter. One and element of race baiters, and that is, if he's so smart, either by academic training or just native smarts, uh, and if he can do such, mm, you know, admirable work in politics. Uh, how come he can't do anything in COVID? Uh, he has been really essentially useless in COVID. He never put That's not his brilliant. Because he uh, is not a manager, right? He is what probably the founding parents worried about the most. He's a democratic despot. And they couldn't quite figure out with the Constitution really how to avoid that. In a typical American, no, no, in a typical American way, we always uh, have some kind of way to address a problem afterwards, because if we address the problem- We could show the founding fathers the video in this impeachment trial, they they would have been able to find a way. I, I feel certain. They would have found a way to improve the Constitution. All right, well, let's, let's reverse they, the characters. They but but it hey, let me ask you. It looked a hell of a lot like the Boston Tea Party, Jay. It looked like the Boston Tea Party. Why, 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 is, right? why is this compartmentalized knowledge so dangerous? Because the priority is wrong. You can take a, a despot, a fascist, if you will, and he will enhance his own power, but he will not operate for the benefit of the community. Is that part of fascism? Well, uh, Trump particularly, in my view, has never been able to do any real work to set a goal and meet it. He does not have the temperament to do that. And you recall the famous dictum that, that Roosevelt may have been a second rate intelligence, but he was a first rate temperament. Mm -hmm. And Trump does not have the temperament to achieve a goal. Uh, if you've ever seen him, you know, especially after his hospitalization, he was as hyper as they come. Um, he should be on Ritalin, but that's just a joke. <laughs> I don't know him personally, but the, oh, the fact yeah. is that if you look at everything that's been achieved in his administration, he's delegated everything. He will go to Mitch McConnell and he will say, I want a tax bill. He won't touch it himself. He won't go to Congress. He won't do the hard work. Or he says, he wants something done with the military, he'll go to one of his generals. He knows who to tap on the shoulder to get the work done. Mary Trump has an interesting scene in her book where she goes, she's helping him. He asks her to do a project for him, with him. And she goes in there and he never talks about the project. And she says, all the time that I was ever in his office, I've seen him on the telephone talking to people, but I, 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 I really don't see anything that he does. He doesn't work. <laughs> I remember that. Mm -hmm. One last point, you guys, uh, for us to address is, is the title of the show, uh, you know, the, the center of our discussion, theoretically, religion and terrorism, a strange connection. Um, what do you mean by that, Gene? Um, let's assume that we take a very broad view of what religion means, um, but how does that get to terrorism, and are we observing that now? Well, you know... The word strange is important here because what we're looking at really is not religion in general, but the strange aspects of religion. In other words, there's a huge controversy going on in America today between scholars and people who consider themselves cult experts. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not scholars. They present themselves as scholars, but they're not scholars and drive scholars to distraction because everything you see, if a, if a new group appears like Jonestown 
Om Shinri Kyo, Solar Temple, whatever, CSA. The first word you get about these people is they're bizarre. They're strange. That's my me. That's where I go. To decode what they're about. And there's always a logic to it. It may be a very emotional logic. It may be a very um, strange, Irrational. different logic. But this, but it is presented as a religious imperative. And that's important because one of the most well-known people in the field of the study of religion, Houston Smith, who died a few years ago, he was the guy who did the LSD experiments with Timothy Leary. Mm -hmm. he, he said at the latter part of his life that he really believed that religion was the most impactful factor in human history. And this was in his lecture on jihadism. And he may be right because people become so committed to it. So in the strange connection between religion and terrorism is when you get into a part of religion that includes the end of the world and what happens after that. It's in, in, you have to destroy the world in order to recreate it because it, is, it has declined so badly that it cannot be repaired and people are in utter despair. So what lifts them out of despair is a belief when somebody comes along and says, I understand this, this is what's going on. The end of the world is coming soon. We have a role to play as the hand of God and we are going to rebuild the world, a better world for our community as we define it. That's what makes it dangerous. Has that ever worked? Change. What? Has that ever worked? Uh, well, what do you mean by it works? That, uh, again, what uh, Gene described is uh, Lincoln and Sherman marching through the South, the battle hymn of the Republic. You can't get much more religious or Christian than that. And the argument was that violence was necessary to destroy tyranny. And Reconstruction would have been the, the building of the new world. So did it work? Well, it worked up until... Uh, a bullet at Ford's Theater, right? I mean, this, I, again, I mean, I think this is, we got to come back because there's so much in what Jean said, which is so helpful. And like a great scholar, she says things that raise really important questions. Like, yes, it may be millennialism, but what is driving these people is also a sense of martyrdom. And not, not all religions, like Judaism does not believe in martyrdom. Uh, not all, so we have a kind of Christ complex going on, and at least as a European historian, I, I would say this at least goes back to Calvinism, where you had an obligation not to obey, but an obligation to disobey. So I, I think, I hope Jane can come back. There's a lot, there's, there's terrorism as expressions of religion, or, or understood in a religious way, but there are also religions in which the potential for terrorism is built into their religious understanding. And that's slightly different. I mean, religions that believe in martyrdom, in which weapons are easily accessible, uh, is a very dangerous, I mean, it's one of the reasons that at least one person has called these folks the American Taliban, a member of a, a Commander. It, 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 the religion you're referring to in America specifically, and we don't have time to go into it now, but everyone should know about it, is called Christian identity. Yes. And let's, it let's, is a, a basic heresy. Yes. No, yeah. let's let's yeah. let's chat about this. And I think uh, that goes back to another fatal flaw of the founding parents, which was not just to allow weapons, but to allow for religion to be a segregated concept, which gets the kind of protection that other behavior does not. And that's a, that's a deep existentialist issue. The UN is guilty of that. People who study genocide are guilty of that. The founders of the constitution are guilty of that. Right? What, why is my religion and my religious institution more important than my body? I mean, why does it matter that I'm a Christian woman but not a, a woman. 
And that's going to open up a whole lot. But I, fi I find that as the existential crisis, that somehow religion is carved out as a separate sphere that gets separate protection from other human behavior. And it may be, as Gene said, that the professor is correct. <laughs> Whether or not we like it, the concept of religion has been so reified. It's surrounded in gold. You can't, you can't touch it. And so, like all societies, we have a real problem with atheism. Most modern societies really cannot understand atheism. All right, that, so that should open up enough for next week. Or two okay, well, let me, let me just uh, ask one more thing. Because Dean and Peter, you know, guys are academics. Um, and you think of these things and study these things and write these things. All the time, Gene will tell you. All the time, and you're trying to make sense of, you know, you're, you're testing these ideas mm -hmm. as against the reality around us. It, it can't be disconnected. So you have to test these concepts and see what they mean today to you. But it strikes me that the things you've been studying, reading, talking, writing about um, are now, okay? We are living in history. Yes. And the history is, is, has the possibility of affecting us more right. than anything that we've ever seen in our lifetimes before. And that must change your perception, Gene. You, you're, you're living in the history you're thinking about. And it could have a profound effect on your personal life. Want to talk about it for one minute? <laughs> Yes, I'm very attracted to the idea of religion and ideology and violence because I was born during World War II and my father went to the South Pacific. And I remember that time and I remember after that time and how impactful. I actually remember listening to Franklin Delano Roosevelt on the radio. And of course, when I was a young person, just at a very vulnerable age, uh, the Vietnam War came along and impacted my generation. I don't think we ever, ever resolved that issue. It's still with us today, as Peter brought out, a lot of the extreme right um, ideology of Stephen Bannon uh, on the fourth turning revolves around what happened in the 60s, and they want to produce something counter distinctive to that. So yes, and I'm very, very impacted by what's going on today, but the need to understand it is paramount. And that's what led me to it, not just that I had prepared in a field, history of religions, which is not very well known, and in nativist millennialism that applied to, that was applicable to what was going on today and has been very, a very productive framework for understanding what's going on around us. Well, thank you, Jean. Thank, thank you, Peter. And you want to you want to respond to that? Uh, why don't no, you I take wanted, one minute wanted, and do that? I want to thank Jean and ask her to come back. Uh, she's very busy. <laughs> I would like her to come back and I and if we could talk a little bit about um, well, the Christian identity yeah. and how and how that might be connected, especially in a global world. Yeah. To, you know, Norway and Hungary, there may be certainly uh, the link between Christianity and identity uh, is, remains very strong in Europe. If we could talk about that. And I think it might be, if we could get a few other people to talk about this question of the unresolved Vietnam War, not necessarily from a military point of view, but it seems to me that we're still dealing with many of those issues of um, well, we'll talk about it later. Well, a thank lot you, to Peter. Peter Anyhow, Hoffenberg. Thank you very um, much. And uh, Jean Rosenfeld, thank you so much for joining us today. Very, thank, very thank interesting you. discussion. Yeah. One which we can have again, and uh, my, I suggest it will be more and more relevant as we go forward. Thank All right. you. Everybody be safe. Take care. Get your vaccines. <laughs>